Hello everyone, welcome to the Rugby League Lunch Hour here at Love Rugby League Towers. It's Thursday, regular slot, 12 till 1. We had a bit of a premature ending yeah, last we week. Yeah, we there was a fire alarm, but we're safe, we were fine, there was no fire. Thanks to those, we had a few comments actually. In fact, I was a bit, we had more comments than we usually do on, yeah. the, on the videos afterwards, so thanks to everyone for their concern. Um, today, a few things today, it's Rugby League's birthday today, 124 years, I want to have a bit of a chat about that with Drew in a minute. Um, we're going to look back at the Challenge Cup final, the 895 Cup final, and we're going to look ahead to the return of league action this week. Thanks as always to our sponsors and our partners at Betfred, um, please do check Betfred out and, and keep supporting them, great, great supporters of Rugby League. Um, so yeah, let's celebrate the birthday. So 29th of August, 1895 at the George Hotel, 22 clubs um, met to discuss, well, to basically withdraw and resign from the Rugby Football Union and create the Northern Union. Now, there's a little bit of confusion in the research I was doing before, because it said there was 22 clubs at the meeting, but it only referenced 21 of the clubs. So does so, that mean 21 agreed? No, no, because one... Jewsbury basically weren't sure, so they pulled out, they basically said they're not going to resign, and I mean, obviously they've joined later on. Oh, right. Um, so, yeah, that, that was it. Anyway, so... There's your um, research, there's your facts for the day. So, so, the, so the plaque that gets recycled every year on um, social media, it's wrong? Well, no, it's not necessarily wrong. There was 22 founding member clubs, but two of them weren't at the meeting, Stockport and Runcorn. Dewsbury were at the meeting but weren't a founder club because they said no. But there's like one, there's like, there's a, there's a, an anomaly somewhere. Was so there a Toronto if, Wolfpacker in I don't, I don't think there was, I don't think there was. Catalan Dragons? If anyone knows what happened. An if, Ottawa? If anyone knows what, what happened. Ottawa I mean, lose? to be fair, to be fair, I'm looking at here on Wikipedia now and it does say 21 clubs. So maybe the bit where I was looking was wrong. Um, so the, the founding member clubs, we'll run through them quick. Batley, Bradford, Brighouse Rangers, Broughton Rangers, Halifax, Huddersfield, Hull, Hunslet, Leeds, Lee, Liversedge, Manningham, Oldham, Rochdale, Onnitz, Runcorn, St. Helens, Stockport, Tildesley, Wakefield, Trinity, Warrington, Widnes and Wigan. Now, I want to have a conversation about this, because we've had a bit of a conversation here in the office, and I basically said to you, name me the five biggest teams that they currently are. Wigan, Leeds, Warrington, St. Helens, and Hull. And Hull. And five of those were, found, well, all five of those were founding members, right? So that was my first point. My second point was, of the 12 Super League teams currently, so we're 124 years on, of the 12 current Super League clubs, seven of those were founder members. And I mean, Witness obviously got relegated last year. That, so last year it was eight. So eight of the 12 Super League teams were founding members. So, you know, the game's not really gone. But, you know, you had 124 years to get four new teams, basically. Yeah. When you look at it like yeah. that, um, but, but we're not negative. Well, James is negative, a bit negative. He's, uh, he's very negative. But uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe in no, another, I'm not, I'm not, maybe, not, hey, maybe in another hundred and twenty-four years, we might be saying I'm not, I'm not, that none of them clubs are I'm, in the top division anymore. It's Ottawa and it's I'm not uh, saying, uh, Valencia. I'm not saying it is a negative thing, more so. I just just find it quite interesting to be honest and um, please do leave your comments as always. Um, let us know your thoughts on rugby league's birthday, whether it'll last another hundred and twenty-four years. Um, there's a, another throwback feature going on the site next week because I've made a discovery today. Rugby League stamps. Mm -hmm. Some stamp collectors out there may have, may remember this. There was a centenary stamp, apparently, is so so our researchers told us. Anyway, enough about that. Like stamps nowadays. Someone must. Surely not. Um, let's look back at last week then, last weekend. Um, Challenge Cup final, uh, Wembley. Yeah. St. Helens, Warrington. Um, I think we were all... I think everyone was hoping that it wouldn't be a, a route and, you know, everyone, well, everyone apart from St. Helens, I suppose. Well, I, I, I picked St. Helens and I thought, and I said on last week's show that I thought St. Helens would win uh, comfortably against Warrington. I'm, I've, got to, I've got to admit, and I'm probably one of many, many uh, rugby league people who thought uh, no Blake Austin in the Warrington team would have uh, just been another nail in the coffin for the Wolves and it would have been a, an easy Saints win. That completely flipped 
flipped the coin on its head because it should, the, the talk was all about Blake Austin, uh, should he or should he not play, and I think all the talk should have been about Lachlan Coote, the, the St. Helens fullback. I think it was close to two months uh, that he'd not played a game uh, with a knee injury. So he came back into the side. Justin Albrook said right at the start of the week that uh, he, were, he were fit, he was ready to go, um, and it'd be 100%. But come game day, we were we was watching the game and he, was, he just looked very, very rusty. And, and for me, I've, I've watched St. Helens near enough every single game uh, this year. I've covered him a lot. And I've never seen Lachlan Coote have a bad game for Saints yet. And that was that on Saturday at Wembley. Uh, it was his first uh, poor performance for the club. He, I think you could, I think it was it was it in the twenty minute mark where Warrington kicked it to him and it just went straight over him. Uh, and it and I just thought, well, there's no there's no pressure on him either. It was a it was a long range kick and there was no pressure and Lachlan Coote just fumbled it. And I think that uh, was just the start of a poor afternoon for the. the, the I mean, the, it's interesting because there's two very contrasting approaches to the game. So. I mean, I think I tweeted this, that Steve Price basically played a blinder, didn't he? Because, you know, he, everything was about Blake Austin. No yeah. one was talking about the fact that Warrington had lost seven out of nine games. He he basically talked them down so much that he built this almost underdog mentality, which you don't normally get when it's first versus second, mm. because normally it's a, a big game. So he's played a blinder there. But on the flip side, looking at St. Helens' preparation, St. Helens have basically been coasting for weeks. They've had, you know, they've been top of the league by a mile. They've been resting players, they've maybe got a bit out of rhythm, and obviously that's come back a little bit. To, but, but where do you think it went wrong for St. Helens on the, on the day? Obviously, you know, Coote, yeah, okay, Coote made a couple of errors. I, I'm not just saying it was Coote, uh, it, Coote's fault that Saints had lost the game. I just thought uh, Warrington were far stronger. Uh, I was speaking to a couple of people, I probably I, I, I best not name them. Um, they told me that um, Jack Hughes, they told me before the game that Jack Hughes has, has been told to follow Lomax. Johnny Lomax, wherever he goes in the game. Uh, and he did that perfectly, didn't he? Jack Hughes, he, obviously, he wore a cricketer's box as well. I bet that was uncomfortable playing rugby league. Um, but obviously, it was Ben Curry that we named at standoff. So, Steve Price, he obviously he likes to play mind games, doesn't he? He named Ben Curry at standoff, but it was actually Jack Hughes who played standoff in the end, and, and uh, Ben Curry moved into his natural position in the back row. I, I, I know, know Darrell Clark was a deserving winner in the last time trophy, a phenomenal display, uh, but if it was up to me, it would have gone to Jack Hughes just because of the diversity that he had to face. He was playing the game with a ruptured testicle. He was in enough discomfort as it was. And to play a, a final like that so well, um, out of position, how many times has he played halfback for Warrington before? Mm. You, can, you can probably count on, on one hand the amount of times he's played halfback before and he did, did his job excellently. He shipped it on to Ratchford when Ratchford came out the back door and let, then let Ratchford do all the pretty work in defence. He followed Lomax wherever he went and I uh, think, I mean, he I, did I, the job. I think the first half, I was worried I was worrying, I was worrying how Warrington would score points because they seemed to just be getting to the end of the sets. Depp Patton was putting up nondescript kicks into the corner that were just being caught relatively easy by St. Helens. But I thought Joe Philbin came on, really having a bit of energy for Warrington. Obviously, he got the try. Um... You know, I thought at one point I thought he was gonna make a goal for Lance Todd. To be honest, well, he got, he got um, one vote, didn't he? Uh, I, th- I thought I, th- I think Philbin's been excellent over the last one or two years. We, we said, we, I think we said this in previous shows. Philbin is a prime example of why why it needs to bring through more of their own players because he gives you that extra ten percent, like we've seen at Wigan. Mm-hmm. And we talk about Wigan every week. You like to see it's Wigan and Saint Helens where and leads to a degree is when you've brought players through your system, they give you that extra 10% yeah. that you don't necessarily get when yeah. you bring in a, a Lama or, yeah. or, or whatever. Definitely, and I think definitely. Philbin, he's not, I'm sure he'll admit he's not the best, he's not the greatest player there's ever been, but if you can put in 110% work rate every week, you know, that's I mean, all you yeah, can have He's getting more and more, and more powerful as, as the weeks go by, isn't he? He carts the ball in so strong. Mm. And, he, and I've watched his, his running st- technique here. He, he runs in and he bounces off with his like with his his arm and he twists with his back so he he'll, he'll just bounce off with the, the initial defender and, and I, run a little charge. I've got a couple of comments. Oh, um, Lewis Bank says I like I like James being negative because it's always good to disagree with him. Um, and Dale Rob says how is it right for Wire having to back up on Thursday after the final weekend? Yeah, we'll we'll talk about that in a minute. But just going back to the final, I think there was a moment there was a set of six in the final where. 
uh, in the second half where Saints had really pinned Warrington back and I think Warrington were basically on last tackle inside their own 15, 20 and Patton put it out on the full. And you thought at that point this could be that you know yeah. that's potentially the game break because Warrington were clinging on a little bit. I mean, don't forget as well, how important was that missed conversion as well from Cooch? So at 12 nil, obviously 12-4, the psychological aspect of going 12-6 compared yeah. to 12-4, it meant that Warrington knew that, yeah, okay, we can't afford to concede many, but we can. We know that if they breach us once yeah. more, we can get away with it, which means that you can go longer into the game, can't you? Because if you're looking at that clock, you know, if you've only got to concede one score, you're looking at the full clock, whereas if you need to concede two, you know that if you can get to 70, 75, yeah. and you've not conceded, and they still got 12-2, it becomes increasingly harder for him to do it. Yeah, and speaking of the psychological aspect, I think it was, it might have been some something like the 50, 55 minute mark where um, Warrington were attacking the Saints line, they were 12 mil up at that point, and I was saying to people in the, in the press box at the side of me, I was saying, why, why not go for a one pointer? Yeah, I know it's early in the game, and it's 50 minutes, 55 minutes, but that'll put you 13 points in front. They've got it. They, then that's in their minds that they've got to score at least three tries. And I thought they might have done to, that to win the game. Half time, actually. And, I, and there was a point where, where Warrington were attacking that Saints line. It was, it was the last tackle. Uh, Stefan Ratchford, who's, who's, who's kicked a few drop goals in his in his career, he was banging in front of the post. Yeah, he was literally yeah. banging in front it of the post. It did look like they were setting up at one point, but they didn't. Yeah, 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 10 or 15 yards out, and he decided to, to kick it into the corner. But I was like, what? Why? I know it's early, and it's 20 minutes before the, the full time out, but I thought that, that would. Uh, Massively, uh, will play a psychological you know, effect on. on you know, fair, fair play to to Warrington. Another um, another challenge cup win for them, which um, I don't think it moves them on the old winners list, does it? I don't think they're up to. Well, they were fourth anyway, so they've now won nine challenge cups. Of course, four of those have come in the past eleven years. Mm-hmm. Um, but what about St. Helens? I mean massively disappointing to be built up that the way that they were and to you know ultimately now ev- all the pressure is on the Super League Grand Final for the two seasons they've had ultimately I mean yeah they've got two league leaders shield and I you know it's another discussion that that should be more revered than it is but ultimately now if they don't win the Grand Final they've basically got nothing mm. to show for the past two seasons uh, 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 yeah I did a little piece on, on that in my um, match report from Wembley that this could be the fur- well, the, the farewell, um, the dream farewell for Justin Albrook at St. Helens is over now because they can't get the treble when so many people, including myself, mm. were tipping them for the treble. And it's it seems to be a reoccurring theme, doesn't it, with St. Helens in, in finals? Um, mm-hmm. It's it's got to be a mental aspect, hasn't it? Is it a mental aspect? I I, I think it's got to be now. Well, it, it, but, there but, can't be too many. One off games where you just don't perform, yeah, it's got to be a, I, be a mental factor. I understand what you're saying, I understand what you're saying, but then at the same time, it's different players, you know. Can it does it is it really that ingrained that you know because St. Helens have lost finals in the past that they're going to lose them again? You know, is that really do we really think that's what I'm just looking here to see I, how many I, I just can't see it being a, co- a coincidence if I'm honest, James. So, so we're looking at St. Helens have now lost, they've lost five Super League Grand Finals and they've lost ten Challenge Cup Finals. This is, of course, in, in the whole history. Obviously, they lost Grand Finals in 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011. Um, so they lost, you know, obviously that was, you know, they lost five in a row there. The, in terms of the Challenge Cup, they lost, obviously, to Warrington this weekend, but how... They hadn't been in a final since 2008, which is when they won. So they've not been in a final for, apart from the one they beat Wigan in, in 2014, they've not been in a final for 11 years. Yeah. So ha- can you put it down to it being a final? Do you know what I mean? I know what you're saying, but there's got. I don't know that the. the, the because there's not, I, I, that, I there's not that many. I, there's not. I mean, not James. I understand, what you're, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, I understand. I understand what you're saying. That, that there's a different squad now to, to what there was ten years ago. I understand that, but I just think there's got to be a mental factor at Saints when they head into finals. Because we all so is the preparation we, wrong. Well, we, we all we all know finals are not just about on the being on the yeah, day. Yeah, it's yeah. the whole build up. So you go to you go to the press day at the start of the week. Yeah. Yeah. 
obviously when I'm, you go think... into London on the Thursday or the Wednesday, uh, you have the captain's run at Wembley the day before the game. I think it's an interesting comparison very, very between different. Steve Price and Justin Holbrook. Because I think, I, I, I think Hol, and I don't mean this, I think Holbrook's quite, not soft, but he's very... We're back. He's very polite and, you know, everything's black and white. Whereas, obviously, Steve... And I'm not saying Steve Price... Has, he might not have deliberately done this, but I feel like Steve Price is a bit cleverer about what he says and the way he portrays himself. And I just think Justin Albrook was very... You know, and obviously, they're winning every week and, you know, he was very, oh, yeah, we're looking forward know, to yeah, it. We're looking forward to it. I know what you're saying. It's no, a great it's, day. It's a great day, you know. It's, it's all it's all some buts because if St. Helens had won the final, they would have been saying... Well, there was no need for Steve Price to play all these yeah. mind games, in, and Steve Price should have been more like Justin Albrook in being uh, calm, cool. And I mean, you've got a you've got to give Steve like. Price a bit of credit as well. You know, he's he's three from three. Like mm-hmm. they've been in three finals, they've now won one. I mean, they've reached every final. They've been in charge. Well, yeah, exactly. Won, you know, if he, yeah, I mean, obviously the grand, the grand finals are different yeah. kettle of fish, but um, he'll be now looking at this as a way that they can springboard to maybe win the Super League. Well, that's the big one, isn't it, for them? Obviously, they, they used to win in the Challenge Cup, as, as we mentioned, four of them in the last 10 last years. years uh, yeah. Last 11 years, sorry. So, they used to get into Wembley, they used to success in the Challenge Cup, which is brilliant. Uh, they should be applauded on that. But they've not proved it in the Grand Final yet. Um, they're doing okay in the league this year. They've been very inconsistent uh, of, of, as of late. Well, I mean, until, if, you, if, we rewind, if you rewind 10 weeks... They've lost. They've only yeah. lost a few. Whereas they've lost seven of the last nine. Um, they've really gone off the ball. Jason, now put your phone on you too. Like, how do you expect me to read your comments, yeah? <laughs> huh? <laughs> Lovely comments, anyway. Um, <laughs> but yeah, should we talk about eighteen ninety five? Cool. Um. Yeah. Can do. So you're a Whitneysian, James. You're, well, I'm not a Whitney. Well, you're not. You're not. You're a Whitney's fan. You're in the. Uh, you're in the, the stands at Wembley. Out in the press box. Uh, Probably, probably, probably one of six pe- six reporters left covering uh, the 1895 Cup final at Wembley. Um, I've done a podcast on this already this week. Witness, witness losing 36-18 to Sheffield. Having Eagle. led 12-0 yeah. and 18-12. The, uh, the Eagles winning the first ever 1895 Cup. We'll probably come on to the, uh, the, the, the timing of the game. Well, yeah, let's well, talk, well, let's we'll talk about the game, game first. first. I, I mean, I've done a podcast on this already. I did a podcast, the Witness Rugby podcast last week, uh, at the weekend. I thought, obviously, Witness losing Johnston was a massive blow. Johnston fractured eye socket after four minutes. I think I think they should have had an interchange hooker on the bench. I think they got away with it in the semi-final, and I think it was a mistake not to have an interchange hooker. I mean, obviously, you can't foresee that yeah. he's going to get injured. But I think that was a mistake. Obviously, Sheffield had the a kit, you know the try Thackeray's try that made it twelve all was a was a was a ball stealing a two man tackle which was a, a poor decision, um, but witness were weren't at the races at all second half and Sheffield were well deserving of their win and you just hope that you know you you feel for Mark Aston really he's flying the flag for the rugby league in Sheffield and, and the local authority aren't giving him a, a great deal of support it'd be great for rugby league if Sheffield was a strong club and. Um, you know, could get bigger. You know, Sheffield's a city and uh, yeah. an attractive place potentially for for a, a team to be. So I think um, they only took one hundred and fifty fans, didn't they? Uh, Sheffield. Um, I think I read that. There's a few more than that, I think. Wasn't no, it? no, I think there was only about. I mean, witness still plenty, didn't there? There was uh, five or six. Yeah, w- there was a very good. Support. So the crowd. So I, 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 I did. I think did I write a column on this? I can't remember. Um, if you look at the crowd from last year, it was up about ten, eleven thousand, wasn't it, on last year? Yeah. And of that ten or eleven thousand, five or six thousand were from Witness. Yeah. So in real terms, the crowd was only up maybe four or five thousand. So as much as there was all this fuss about Catalan last year, ultimately, in a like for like comparison, the crowd's only gone up four or five thousand from last year. So sort of makes a mockery of the whole asking for five hundred grand, doesn't it? Uh, it does. But the whole organisation of the the day just didn't make sense from the off, did it? The, the 1895 Cup Final should have been on before the Challenge Cup Final. Scrap the Stephen Mullaney trophy because... Well, just bet that earlier, surely. But, but, but fans can't watch the game anyway because the gates, are, the gates are shut while the first half of the game... Yeah, but the, the mums and dads and all that can watch, can't they? 
come on. The, the, what, how many? 50 people in the well, studio? Yeah, I, yeah. 50 people I mean, watching? Yeah, I understand what you mean. Go and see if you can have it on at Old Trafford before the grand final then uh, and have the 1895 Cup before because there's no point in playing all this then if you're going to just play it after the Challenge Cup final. Yeah, I mean, I'm just... Like, I reckon there was about 8,000 in the, it left in Wembley for the 1895 final. Well, if that. And I think, like, yeah. I mean, I think they, the day did feel very disjointed. I don't think there was a big build-up to the, there wasn't a big enough build-up up to the kick-off, I didn't think, of the of the Challenge Cup final. Um, you know, obviously you have all the presentation and, you know, and all the introductions. So I just didn't think there was enough of a build-up with a by me and stuff. I just didn't, I, I don't know, I just didn't feel a build-up. I, I, someone tweeted me a video of what it was like in 2008. Um, which was the last time Satan's were in it, and it was sold out, and it was it looked unbelievable. And, and you must admit, you, you can't compare that to, to how it was. Obviously, you had all the empty seats. But what what can we do, realistically? Because, I mean, all people do is moan about the attendance and moan about this and moan about that. But the reason rugby league's struggling is because people are moaning and not getting off. And, yeah. you know, They're not actually, the, the ones who were moaning were, were the ones yeah, who didn't go to the and grounds themselves. Like, and, and I think that's the thing. I think rugby league... Rugby League fans seem to be moaning as if someone else is going to fix yeah. the problem, but it's like, well, the reason why the seats are empty is because Rugby League fans aren't turning up, you know, and, and I mean, yeah, there's the argument that the pool of Rugby League fans isn't big enough to sustain three, four major events a year, and, you know, completely on board with that. Um, it'll be very interesting to see whether the change um, in date affects things next season. Um, another thing that I quite... I mean, I'm not too sure on the figures on this, but I do believe that Rugby League has moved in a positive direction with the Challenge Cup final because the ticket prices, as much as people will probably moan at me for saying this, the ticket prices have gone up a little bit. And I think that is a positive move because I just think it's ridiculous for you to be able to get a ticket for Wembley that's cheaper than watching Wakefield on it at yeah. Bellevue. I just think it's ridiculous. A final needs to have a premium prize. And OK, yeah... You're not selling out at the moment, but it gives Rugby League something to, to move forward to. If you're selling out 90,000 at £10 a ticket, what's the point? You know, Whereas at least now you can say, oh, we've sold 62,000 at a fair price point, next year we'll target 70, and then we'll get back up to where you've got 90,000 pay, paying the, the fair price. That's my you, position. You do, the, I, I, I tweeted about this the other day, there's just too many events in Rugby League. For people, people or clubs, the RFL, are asking for too much off, the same too thing. small of a, yeah, a, yeah. Of a support base. Um, where clubs are asking to go on international tours. Clubs these days are obviously travelling to Toronto, they're, they're travelling to Catalans, yeah. they're travelling to Toulouse. I mean, that so was, that's, that's an holiday in, in itself, what, that's what, two or three days. Warrington's following I thought was disappointing at the final, I must admit. But they have been, they played Catalan twice this season, including the uh, the infamous Battle of Perpignan a couple of weeks ago. Um, uh, you know, and it's like, you like say, it's just how, how can you, you know, fans, and, and, I'm, and I'm sick of reading about North American culture on Twitter, I'm sick of this event on Twitter. Oh, well, North American culture says you don't have to go all over the way. Rubbish. Rugby League is being built on fans going home and away. And if you've got fans who've been going home and away for 60 years and you're all of a sudden you're telling them, well, actually, we don't want you to go home and away because we want them to play in every corner of the globe. It's like people people will, by their nature, sort of oppose that. And I think, you know, if, if, if Joe Bloggs wants to go to watch his team away, he's going to go to Catalan. But how many times can Joe Bloggs afford to go to Catalan? He might not be able to. You know, he might be able to go to Catalan because he can persuade his wife to come with him for a little bit of an holiday, whereas he can't necessarily do that when they're playing when, at Wembley. Um, we've got a comment here of Daniel Hunt saying, let's just continue continuously slag off Sheffield. Fantastic, are you being unbiased? Um, what do you mean? So I like did Sheffield, you say it? anything? I, 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 I only said they, they, they sold 150 tickets, didn't it? I didn't. Uh, no, I think. I, like, I, like I said, I you think. You want to write for us as well? We. Um, no, I think we. I think we we said about Mark Aston, haven't we? He needs support. He needs support. Mark Aston's a needs, fantastic bloke. He needs support from the council, doesn't he, to get the stadium yeah. off the ground? And you know, hopefully they can try and. Uh, we're, we're saying they've got a, yeah, they've got a small support base. Everyone knows they've got a small fan base, but if they got support from the Sheffield Council, I think, and they got a new ground. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, obviously the plans are there. The you know, they, 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 they've they, got some fantastic people at that club. They've, they've, moved, they've, moved, they've moved back to Olympic Legacy Park. You know, on the premise that there's going to be a stadium, and, and there's there's been no progress there. And to be honest, it's a you know it's a disgrace of a ground to be playing at. They've got special dispensation to play there. 
but it's out of their hands. It's like they lost a bid to get to get the the rights for the ground there. Sheffield United got it, and they're sat there waiting. And obviously, there's nothing Mark Aston can do about that situation. He's just got to put his team out. And I, I think Mark Aston's the glue that has held Sheffield yeah, and course, together yeah, over over the last. Yeah, how, how many years? You, you can name how many years. But um, Paul Harrison, poor organisation. Our wife, our wife is witness. We could not find a coach that arrived before the Charles Cup final and left after the 1895. Yeah. Um, that's why everyone disappeared. Phil Hayes replied to that. National Express were doing coaches covering both games. I travelled down with one from Witness. He's arrived in Witness with Saints fans on as well. Uh, Paul Harrison then replied to Phil saying club coaches didn't though which uh, which most people will book on which is, yeah, yeah, which is, is fair, fair enough really yeah. um, um, you, you always book book three clubs don't you well yeah you, you tend if, to um yeah so it, it, just, it was just sad like I, I was just sat there watching the the winning Sheffield game and obviously when, when you're at Wembley you, you fire it was a weird atmosphere you, you, you fire like, away from the, the yeah, pitches yeah, it is yeah, anyway yeah. you're not like at a normal yeah. ground where there's f- maybe five or ten metres between yeah. the fans and the, the yeah. touchline uh, you're already far out because of because of all the. It was a weird. A- it was it, 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 it was a, it was a weird atmosphere. Uh, right? I, and I just thought the game the game on field the on field product were, were excellent to watch. Thackeray and Pat Walker I thought were outstanding I, I, for Sheffield. Sheffield had a real balance. There. I really like Aaron Brown. I've seen him a few times. I've seen him at Dewsbury. I think they had a real balance to their team. And, that, and, 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 um, Sheffield. I, I was looking at the history of some of the players. Um, and and there was a good bunch of them players who came through the old what's now defunct Sheffield Academy system. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they had they had Corey Macklin as well, USA International. US, first, USA International. Well, we reckon the first USA International to score at Wembley. And uh, Jamaica International, Joel Farrell as well, mm. signing signing a new two year. I like Nathan Mason football. as well. I, I, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm surprised he's, he's not had more of a, a chance at London. To be fair, with the one this year, I, 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 I think he's a really good player. Yeah, he was he was very impressive at Lee last season. Um, um, Let's let's we'll move on from from last week. We'll look at to the weekend. Let's have a, have a run through some news um, from this week. A Wigan forward facing gouging charge. Um, Ethan Havard, who is uh, you know more about him than. Oh, we Bradley up the Eagles, he said. Yeah, prop. So we're, getting, we're getting a Sheffield forward. Ethan, we're not. We're not. Be, we're not. E- we're not calling Sheffield. Ethan Ethan Havard is up for a tribunal for a Grade E gouging charge for the Wigan academy. And yeah. um, Toulouse are going to pay tribute to Archie Bruce. Uh, the Batley scrum half hawk who died after the game in Toulouse a couple of weeks ago. There was a, a minute's applause at Wembley last week, but there's going to be a minute's applause ahead of Toulouse's game with Dewsbury in the Championship on Saturday. Oh. Um, you all right, Drew? We keep, um, keep sticking. Seeker Manu is going to hang up his boots at the end of the year for Hull, so I, I, that's I, him I, and Mark Minichello that they're losing. Yeah, Lee Radford said he's, he's one of Hull's best overseas signings of the Super League era. Uh, and I, I, I struggle to disagree with with Ralph and I think manu has been excellent in Super League. I, I've enjoyed watching him play. He's just he's just a battering ram, isn't he? Uh, he certainly. Well, uh, I mean, the like Tom to, the Tom and Terminator's got a lot to live up to. Exactly. Well. You, you, but you wouldn't like to run a either Minicello or um, Seeker Manu, would you? In well, that battle. Um, Swinton. Um, so the big thing this year, this week, we've had this story on the site before. Um, it's not going away. Swinton are hinting at renaming to Manchester for next season. Um, <laughs> there's been a little bit of a kick off on Twitter because there's a couple of Manchester clubs that are a bit unhappy at, at the mm. prospect of this um, a, few, a few thoughts from me obviously Swinton a historic club but they're stuck they've not played in Swinton for nearly 30 years um, you know clearly there's no there's nothing on the horizon that suggests they're going to move back to Swinton obviously with the move towards big city teams mm. rebranding as Manchester is a positive but I must admit as someone who's met with Manchester Rangers a few times and seen the facilities that they had that the Etihad is rugby league guilty of cutting its nose to spite its face? Like Manchester, Possibly, Rangers, yeah. they wanted to come into League One. They were told no because there was four other teams, you know, Oldham, Salford, mm. Rochdale, and Swinton. But now you're at the situation where because Swinton are now going to try and go towards Manchester, you're already you're, you're annoying Manchester Rangers and Mancunians who are already doing things in Manchester. Whereas you could have completely avoided that situation by just allowing Manchester Rangers to come through. Yeah, okay, Swinton may have been, you know, at odds with that, but. I don't know, something just doesn't sit right with me. I do think it's probably the right move for Swinton. I do think they could have managed it a little yeah. bit better. I'd maybe try to call yourself Manchester Swinton Lions for a year or two and, and sort of do it a bit quieter than they are. Um, but there's no real time to waste for Swinton because, you know, you're looking at the 2021 broadcast deal. 
they've got a lot more clout as Manchester than they have as Swinton. Definitely. But I suppose the argument of Manchester Rangers and Mancunians is, well, hang on, you know, there's already rugby league in Manchester. We're already here. What are Swinton going to do that we're not already doing? The only thing that Swinton have got that they haven't is the championship place. Um, I, I do agree. Um, Mancunians were better. Sorry, Manchester Rangers were basically told to merge with Oldham. Yeah. That was basically what. And and all all the thing is they're on a, they're on a hiding to nothing if they do that because if Manchester Rangers come along and say oh well we're going to buy Oldham and merge with them you're immediately going to alienate all them Oldham fans that don't understand. Whereas if they come in as a new entity, yeah okay they might pinch fans off clubs but they're not tread they're not stepping on the history and you know the exist the heritage of the existing club. I do agree. Uh, obviously, the Gary Carter of the Sun did did an interview with Andy Maisie, the Swinton chairman, uh, earlier on this week, and uh, Maisie did say that obviously if, if they do want to survive in the near future, then they're going to have to change the name to, to Manchester to, yeah. uh, to get to get the. Interaction. It makes no they, sense. They've got an inter- they've got right. obviously when I I spoke to Andy Maisie a couple of weeks ago, uh, a couple of months ago. Sorry, I think it might have been in June. Uh, early June, and he said he, he, he put a lot of emphasis on them being a Manchester club. Obviously, they've got an M twenty seven post club. Mm. They want to, they want to put a lot of emphasis on Manchester. They want to welcome team city teams like Toronto yeah. uh, to play the Manchester Lions or the Manchester Swinton Lions. Um, Moving I, th- on. I, th- I think they've got to do it, haven't they? Yeah, they've, they've, they've got, got to do it in, at some point in the future. So it's just a, I, th- I think it's a, it's a matter of if and when. Um, other news then, Newcastle um, has replaced Cumbria as the final venue to stage games at the World Cup. So Newcastle's Kingston Park will host three games which were slated for the new stadium in Cumbria which is now not going ahead. Um, Kingston Park, really nice facility, really nice artificial pitch. Um, obviously Newcastle's already got some games in St James's Park as well. Um, Tony Gijo, the Lance Todd Trophy winner from last year, he is leaving Catalan at the end of the year. Um, interesting one there because... We have this conversation a lot about Catalan signing English players and, and Aussie players and you know Antipodean players, whatever. It's bad. Surely it's a bad thing for Catalan to be losing someone like Guizhou, just like it was when they lost Escaré. Surely the best French players should be playing for Catalan. Surely that's the whole purpose of it. Agree, and obviously the, I, I know F- F- the old Farge made the move. What, I think was he seventeen or something. Yeah, went to Salford. Yeah. To Salford. Um, but players like Farge and Escaré and Gijo, they should all be playing at Catalan, mm-hmm. shouldn't they? Roman and Romain And, and, and obviously Gijo's had his nose put out because they signed Tompkins and you know, and obviously they got James Maloney coming over. And yeah, I, Where yeah, do we think I, he's going to end up? I, 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 I think it's a blow for Catalan, no, really, yeah. I really do. But then again, uh, I think you can only have one fullback in Tony Gijo or Sam Tompkins, can't you? I, but, I, but I would make the point, well, why sign Tompkins well, exactly, in the first place? Exactly, but you ended up with two. And I, and I think they've realised that they may, well, they, only need well they can't keep Gijo happy, can they? Yeah. And that's why he's leaving. Huddersfield um, or Toronto, uh, yeah, do you think? Uh, our partners, Tres Mondial, our French partners, check out the French roundup if, if you've not done so already. Uh, out every Monday to Tuesday. Um, they've, Tres Mondial have linked in with Toronto, they've linked in with Huddersfield, and they've also linked in with St. George of the Warren Dragons. Uh, in the NRL. He, did, he did go to the he NRL played, briefly. Yeah, yeah. He, had, he had one season in the NRL. He didn't play, he didn't 2010 play, for Crowe. Cro- 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 yeah, he didn't make an appearance. Obviously, he was be- very, very young back then. A, a little tale. When Matthias Power went to Lee Centurions a couple of years ago, I think it might have been 2016, around that point, uh, from Catalans to, to Lee, he actually offered, uh, Catalans offered Lee. Matthias Pallet or Tony Gijo and uh, Lee went for, for power and obviously Gijo excelled um, at, uh, at the Dragons. He played for Jewsbury for a little bit as well, Gijo, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the Dragons, uh, no, I, th- I think Gijo will go to Huddersfield if I'm taking an early punter. I mean, don't get me wrong, I don't, think it's a bad, I don't think it's a bad thing at all to have French players playing for overseas player clubs. So like we've seen with the London the London contingent of players, it's better for them to go elsewhere. It's just, you worry that for every French player that Catalan get rid of, are they bringing another French player through or are they just signing a, an Englishman or an Aussie or, or whatever? I think that's my concern with it. Um, St. Helens are going to get the league leader shield on Friday against Casford, which will be interesting. Um, the one thing that annoys me, well, not annoys me, but the one thing that I find a bit hypocritical about this is why did they present Toronto with the league leader shield at Widnes, which caused all sorts of bother? But then St. Helens have been waiting and waiting to have a home game to do theirs. I don't understand why 
they would have presented it to Toronto at a game where they had 10 fans there, where they could have just presented it at Toronto in front of 7,500. Yeah. It looked miles better on the pitches. Yeah. Um, Scotland... But it's, 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 it's slightly um, bad timing, isn't it? Well, yeah. yeah for it's, it's, it's a little, it would have it been... They would have been smiling, they would have been laughing if yeah, they had like yeah, obviously yeah. won the it, Challenge It's Cup probably going to be as depressing as last year. It could have had a, a double gonna, whammy. And if not, it will be more depressing. Yeah, it's going to be even more depressing than last year's, which will be some, some going. Um, Scotland captain Oliver Wilkes has announced his retirement. He's had a stellar 21-year career. He's been with Workington most recently. Casford have confirmed that Luke Gale will not be back from injury in 2019. So... Um, well, I've heard a bit of it. I don't know. We, have we had this? Has Ray Moore had this in his gossip column? I don't, I don't think he has. Not yet. Um, not yet. Apparently, keep Luke, an eye, Luke, keep Luke, an eye, Luke yeah. Gale's uh, having chats with all the clubs. Yeah. We're led to believe. Um, Witness have released top try scorer Ryan Ince in a bit of a bizarre move. It, it would appear that um, allegedly uh, Ince wasn't happy about being dropped for the 89 5 Cup final. Um, to be honest, if I was a top try scorer at a club, I think I'd be a bit miffed if I wasn't playing at a club final at Wimbledon. I, I, I was bewildered, um, to be fair, at, at why he didn't play. I've, I've always been a, a fan of Brian. Paul Gallen is going to play his last game of rugby league on English soil, which is a bizarre one. He's playing at, he's at Wakefield as well, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, yeah. Um, he's, he's playing in a charity match for Random. the Teenage Cancer um, Trust. Yeah, Barrow, Paul Gallen All-Star versus Wakefield Trinity All-Star. Barrow will be relegated this weekend if they lose against Toronto. They're without Liam Paisley and Nathan Mosby are out for the season. I think Liam Paisley will be a great pick-up for someone in Championship next season. Um, Dewsbury Moore players have got tattoos in memory of Archie Bruce, who we mentioned earlier there's a tribute at Toulouse um, this weekend. It's we haven't to, talked about this. It's yeah. great to say the rugby league community is rallied around, hasn't it? Yeah, very eight thousand pound yeah. raised on the Just Giving page. There's a link on the website if you were if you want to have a look at that. Um, we haven't talked about this, but we'll bring it up now. St. Helens obviously contacted the RFL about the Morgan Knowles try at Wembley. We won't spend too much time on this because we've already spoke about the final. But <coughs> I mean, <laughs> it should have been sent upstairs, it shouldn't it? I think. But, 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 but when, you, when you play it at full speed, it looks as though Morgan Knowles just slaps the ball down in the bottom. Because the yeah, ball the fires up from well, the I think the, the problem you've got is I think the, we've got to a situation now where the referees are almost scared to refer to the video referee because they get criticised for it, don't they? Yeah. They get criticised when they refer to the video referee and everyone's like, oh, you know, another video ref. But then when they don't refer to the video ref, I think the point here is a bit, we've seen it with football like a bit at the moment, is surely in the time between the try happening and the tap taking place, surely the video ref can quickly yeah. see a replay. Now, I don't know how... I don't know how the technology impacts on this, but when you watch the NRL, if they go to a video ref in NRL, how quick do they get to the, <laughs> the point of action? He, he puts up the screen, and then they're already looking at the ground, whereas over here, he puts up the screen, you wait 20 seconds, then it on, and, and you, not, not you, watch, goal, the you, watch, yeah, you watch the three tackles before, <laughs> before you get to the ground, and it's like, well, <clears throat> it's no wonder people are getting cheesed off, it's taking too long, whereas the NRL, they're like, right, we want to check the ground in, so we're going to go straight to the ground in, yeah. because... Don't forget, there's multiple reasons a try can be disallowed. Over here, it feels like you spend that much time looking at, say, say, I don't know, say it's a kick and someone's knocked it back and then they've run on and grounded it. But you might have knocked on with the ground, but they've spent 10 minutes looking at how the ball came loose at the kick when, actually, you get to the ground and you didn't ground it anyway. Obviously, <coughs> my, my opinion, if it, if it did go to the screen, it, it was a try, wasn't it? Yeah, oh, yeah. He, he's, got his, he's got his fingertips on um, it. It was a try. But, but... certainly, right, I mean, what, what can you do? There's mistakes every week. I think you can't. What, what are they going to do? They can't turn around and say, oh, you know, we're going to replay the final. Got a couple, <laughs> got a couple more comments coming through. Louis says, we played Manchester Rangers a few times when they started. It was great for the ones at Culture the Eagles to play. It's a it. fantastic facility. Yeah. I've been there. I was actually there yesterday. To, to uh, play in a great, great stadium with a good crowd. Why the RFL knocked them down is beyond me. David Taylor also adds. Personal opinion, uh, Sam Tompkins is bad for the Catalan's culture, not a personal attack. Uh, I, I disagree there, obviously, I know, I know there was the, the Sam Tompkins and Joel Tompkins um, video nasty that went uh, viral. Um, was it last year? Was it last year? Or yeah, yeah, last year. Um, guy, didn't it? But, but honestly, I, I, I when, think... I, when I used to work at Wigan, Sam, Sam was a... a the ultimate professional. No, I think I think if you yeah, if you you can see why Catalan have signed Tompkins because if you were to pick one player that you know if you were to pick a rugby league player that apart from Burgess apart from Sam yeah. Burgess maybe for Catalan he's if you were if you were Catalan you would think right we're gonna pick we're gonna sign one player that every rugby league fan would have heard of 
I think Tomkins would probably yeah. be fit that bracket, wouldn't yeah. he? Yeah, and he's a, he's a natural leader as well. He was he was honestly sensational for for Wigan last season, um, and played a, a very very key role in what if, they, they went on to do. Before we final. look ahead to uh, uh, Louis says Stuart Cummins asked to come out uh, has come out and said. If it went up as no try, it would have stayed no try as the pressure was on the side of the ball, not the top of the ball. No. So not down with pressure. Yeah, I've obviously, seen that comment because it was on, I've seen Ian Smith say this as well because yeah, it wasn't downward pressure, it was like sideways pressure, so Yeah. Uh, who knows, obviously. Well we'll never obviously know. Obviously we, um, we see on Sky when a, a decision goes to the video ref and Stuart coming says it's a try and then it's an all try and vice versa. We've more news before a few times. More news before we look ahead to the weekend's game. James Donaldson's keen to extend his time at Leeds, I bet he is. Um, mailbox, if you want to write in and, and raise a topic for debate, please do send us one via the Facebook page or email me at james at lovebelieve.com. But this week's mailbox, Phil Raymond wants to put a time limit on video ref decisions. That's an interesting one. Uh, I'll I, 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 I'm <coughs> that to be fair, though, yeah. because that that obviously help with yeah. what you're saying. Alrix um, Alrix De Costa is a uh, is staying at Catalan for another year. Another French player um, staying at Catalan. That's a good, a good thing. Now well. here's one French roundup this week. So all the all the news from France. Um, a few French referees are targeting in the the 2021 World Cup, the Nines World Cup at the end of the year. They've already had Farge, Morgan Esker and Navarrete confirmed to play in Which that. Which is good for the French Which game. Good. The um, most important players play. But the biggest one for me in the French round this week was that Lorraine Biville is part of a 36 women's squad to go on trial for the first Gold Coast Titans women's NRL team. Very which nice. good. 20 years old. Um, she moved to Australia to give it a go. Rugby league. She's been playing for East Tigers. Um, Not bad living on the Gold Coast as well. If it, if she, uh, yeah. She so, made it. Right, so let's look at this weekend, final 15 minutes, as always, as we do on a Thursday. This is the Rugby League Lunch Hour on loverugbyleague.com. Please do check out the website for all the latest. Thanks to Betfred, as always. Please do leave your comments, predictions, as we go through this. Um, I tell you what, spoiler alert, if you're watching the NRL, we've missed an absolute boomer in the NRL while we've been on here. What's a boomer? Well, it, there's a, it's a one-point It's a one-point ball game. I was moaning because it was 2 2 at half time, but it's, uh, yeah, anyway. Tonight's game, Salford Warrington. Touched on it before. Warrington being screwed over a little bit by playing. Obviously, they, they um, made, they made um, I think it might have been five changes to the squad that um, obviously won at Wembley. Probably Chris Hill is probably still on go over, um, and rightly so as well, because I, I, I would have been on the pop for. Four or five days after, it, after it's, a, it's actually a massive like game, isn't it? It's actually a massive it's, game as well. But but I think it's it's more of a massive game for Salford at this moment in time. Well, you say that, but if Salford win, they're on level points with Warrington. If Casford win tomorrow night, which maybe they won't, Warrington faced the prospect of having five teams. That's without Wigan and Hull. I'm not even mentioning Wigan and Hull. Salford and Casford will be on thirty with Warrington. Now, depending on the result, depending on how many Salford win by, Salford could actually go above Warrington. So Warrington could find themselves fifth come Sunday. And all of a sudden thinking, oh, actually, we might not make the playoffs. Uh, Warrington will make the playoffs, James. Yeah, is that what you're going with? But, but, but I think Salford will win tonight. So you I, think Salford will win tonight? I, I, think, I can't remember what I'm predicting, but I, uh, I mean, by him, but I, I think Salford I think, will win. I think, I think you look at it and you think, if, Hull, if Warrington, Wigan and Hull win this week, they're going to be the four, aren't they? And then yeah. it becomes a shootout between Salford and Cass. Uh, and maybe uh, and maybe Catalan. I predicted Cass a couple of weeks back. I've got to stick with Cass to, to make the final. <laughs> so, Even though so, they've got a sorry, they've got so tough. Fun. Do you think they'll beat Saints tomorrow, Casford? No. <laughs> Probably not, but I've got to stick with Cass but I can't change my prediction Hull, now, James. Hull, I've got one of Hull have got Huddersfield, so you'd imagine you fancy Hull for that one. Yeah, I, I, yeah I think. Um, but uh, interesting to see that just. Chester Butler uh, will make Play his Huddersfield. Huddersfield um, Saturday then, Catalan and LKR. Now, I fancy LKR, I mean. They, they, they've yeah, got in a bit Catalan, of... A, it? I know, but, you know, you say that, but Catalan, it's just... They're in a mess, Catalan, aren't they? And I, I don't know, I just... I just feel like... I'm the, not expecting LKR to go down. Have you seen the video um, of Bernard Gouache in the dressing yeah, room? Yeah, in the dressing room, uh, yeah. Catalan going... Um, mad, yeah. Going... Yeah, just, there's clearly much. something not right there, but he was going absolutely mental. Of course, if if and Salford, Steve McNamara was just sat there, there's weird. something. If, yeah, Sol, something if, if Salford and Cass win this week and Catalan lose, that's pretty much Catalan done for playoffs. 
Um, I'll be four points straight for free to go. I, I, I fancy Catalans all to be talking. Yeah. Um, Sunday, London Leeds, which is a big one in the relegation scrap. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, we thought Leeds were, were free of it. We thought 20 points would be enough. But if London beat Leeds this week, London would go up to 20. Leeds have 20 as well. And, you know, all of a sudden you might need 22 to stay up. I've predicted Leeds for this week. You think Leeds? I think... Um, I, I, I think Leeds are coming good towards the back end of the year under Ag- Richard Agar. Uh, I think they'll be they'll be fair. And then Wakefield Wigan. Um, you're going Wigan for that, I presume. Yeah. Yeah, but Wakefield's not been happy. I've not seen for the Warriors no, in recent no. years, but uh, I'll I'll go. So Wigan. Yeah, so looking fine. at the looking at the top, Saints got forty six, so they're all home and dry. Warrington, Wigan, and Hull are all on thirty. Salford and Cats on twenty eight, and Catalan on twenty six. Uh, and at that bottom, Leeds and Wakefield both on 20. Huddersfield, Ulcar and London all on 18. I mean, honestly, if London win this weekend, it's blown wide open again. I, I, I do think if... I, I think if London win this weekend, I worry for, for Hulkar and Huddersfield. Um, don't forget as well, London have got to Did, play Hulkar and Wakefield. David Taylor <coughs> made his predictions. Why am I six at Salford? Mm, interesting. FC by 12 against Giants. Saints by 14 versus Cass. Uh, Dragons by 20 against OKR. Leeds by 6 at London. I thought, I mean, is Dave not an OKR fan? I think he's a Lather. Oh, is he? Right? He might be. I'm getting confused. I'm getting confused. Uh, Leeds by 6 at London. And Wigan by 12 at Wakefield. They're solid predictions, I think. But apart from, I don't think. Catalans will win by 20, I might be wrong, um, uh, I don't think why will win. There's some uh, some Leeds based games tomorrow night, Friday night, there's a National Conference League Division 2 match, East Leeds against Clockface Miners, a 6.30 kick off, I wonder if our mate Dave Parkinson knows about that one, yeah, uh, and Women's Super League as well, Leeds versus Bradford. Championship then this weekend, Saturday there's two games, Toulouse, Dewsbury, Toulouse, Toronto, Barrow, if Barrow lose there, down, Toronto, um, Sunday's game, Batley, Featherstone, Bradford, Sheffield. Featherstone, Bradford. Halifax, Rochdale. Halifax. Lee, York. Lee. And Widnes, Swinton. Um, we'll have a look at the... Uh, hey. We'll have a look at the... Um, <laughs> have a look at the championship table. So, obviously, Toronto, home and drive, 48 points. Oh, is it Cumbrian? Who's your sport, Dave? Just so we know what comments. Yeah. I um, a later. Um, Toronto, top and 48. Toulouse and Lee both have 36. So, they're in the box seat for them top... Second and third. It's critical to finish top three, isn't it? Lee, um, sorry, Lee on 36, York on 35, so York can't finish, oh actually they can, York needed one more win to basically guarantee top four. Featherston a fifth on 32, and then Sheffield on 30, so um, Sheffield can still make the playoffs, but they probably have to win both of their last two and hope Featherston lose both of theirs because the points difference is quite significantly different. And obviously um, Bradford have played the last, well they say they've yeah. Oh. Uh, the last Bradford can Southern still weekend. Bradford can still sneak the playoffs, but they'd need Feverston to lose. They'd need to win two out of two. They need Feverston to lose two out of two. Um, so it's 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 looking unlikely for Bradford. Um, and at the bottom, as we say, Barrow three points to drift of Widness. So if Widness win this week, it's all over with Barrow. But it may well be all over before Widness play because Barrow out of Toronto away. Um, league One on Sunday, we're getting to the final throws of the League One season. Coventry, Oldham, Doncaster, Keithley, Hunslet, Workington, Newcastle, North Wales, and Whitehaven, West Wales. I mean, it's Whitehaven's to lose for sure because their last two games are against West Wales and Coventry. Whitehaven on 28 points with two games to play. Oldham on 26, Newcastle on 25, Hunslet on 24, Doncaster on 20. Uh, Workington on 19. Yeah, um, from Barrow. Say again. It's Barrow. From Barrow. Workington are pretty much nailed on a playoff. They'd have to lose both their games and North Wales would have to win both of theirs for that to change. Really, despite to see London Scholars down in eighth place, they they must have lost a fair few in a row because yeah. they were they were top of the league at one point. <coughs> um, one comment I said, you see a Hunslet game last week? Hunslet yeah. Scholars uh, went for a drop goal at 30 all. Did the Scholars, he got charged down. Hunslet took it at the other end and scored and won 34 30. That's what you like to see, though. It was on the hour league app, wasn't it? It was, it? It was, was Friday Night Lights. I think it, it was, was 3,000. Yeah, um, it was on the hour league app. In attendance. Um, women's Super League on Sunday. Dave drives to Catalans every year. Drive. Drive. That's it. What's he got? A motor on? I hope he's got a yacht. <laughs> well, 
they'd probably go on the channel or the ferry or something. Maybe. Oh. I, I tell you what, actually, one year I went to Catalan and I flew from London Stansted and I bumped into a London Broncos fan who goes to all Catalan's home matches because you can fly 25 quid return, you go Saturday morning, come back Sunday night. 25 quid return. Quarter. So yeah, so when London weren't at home, he'd go Catalan. We're, we're currently in the process of booking the French Magic Weekend. Sponsors! Yeah, we're up for sponsorship. We need, we need we'll we'll, we'll, we'll carry your flag, like... we'll, we'll put your logo on our t shirt. We're going to Carcassonne. If, the... if, if you pay enough money, <coughs> you get your logo tattooed on me. French Magic Weekend. French Magic Weekend kicks off the French season. It's November 16th, 17th. Um, six games, I think, yeah. Uh, uh, all at Carcassonne. Beautiful place, Carcassonne, as well. So hopefully, we'll, we'll hopefully, hopefully be there. We'll hopefully, hopefully do a few the, lives. Hopefully, the weather will. will hold out as well me and James went to Barcelona earlier on this year for, for the new camp game between Castle and Wigan and all the way back to be sunny and warm while I was in the new camp on the day of the game it absolutely threw it down all weekend <laughs> we, we went to the captain's room to get some interviews with Adrian oh, Lamb yeah. and some of the, some of the Wigan the players day, I think, and they couldn't even train on the rugby pitch because the weather well, was that bad the, the, cap, the captain's room were, were just on a, on, on a college play field yeah, yeah. and it was an absolute journey from from where from we were there. <laughs> yeah. uh, right the, the furthest out on the on the furthest stop on the, the metro um and then once we got out it was about an half an hour walk or it certainly felt like that I and mean, it was absolutely covered weren't we, we were we were we, uh, women's super league then sunday cast for wigan wakefield york st Helens. i ain't got a clue what the league table's like because no one publishes it Dave <laughs> Taylor says the Land Rover only 600 quid on diesel. <laughs> oh, Six, how many times are you having to stop? You, mu- you must be loaded, Dave. Sponsor us. We're, we're going to <laughs> yeah. France. He could give us a lift. He could give us a lift. You could, you could come <laughs> wherever you drive. <laughs> we could do like a documentary, couldn't we? French Magic Weekend. Yeah, we're there. Um, we're, we're near enough finish. Relegate back. Like, before we go, relegation from Super League, are you still going to London? We still go in London. I I I have to stick with my predictions. Hey, I can't go changing, can I? Well, I mean, you didn't publish the article last time, so no one knows what you predicted. <laughs> sorry, team. Yeah. Sorry, um, team. No, I'll I'll go with. I, I've got. You still I've, going I've London. Said London all along. I've got I mean, to stick with I must admit, I think London. I think this Sunday. I mean, we say it every week, don't we? It's a big game this Sunday <laughs> because if they can win this week, then all of a sudden you're thinking, well, flipping heck. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just getting the French the French Magic Weekend fixtures up here. D- Dave, well, Dave's on a roll here. It says, was there a real fire last week? There, were. there wasn't a real fire. Thanks for asking, Dave, but there wasn't. We had a few people. Someone actually tweeted me, actually, asking if we were all right. Um, oh, good, good. They called good Lucy song. the receptionist as well, which I quite like. I bet she was fuming. What? Like oh, Lucy hey. the receptionist. Sack <laughs> that off. Get that, um, get that Twitter by your change. Right, so, so <laughs> French, French Magic Weekend, if you fancy joining us. Um, Carcassonne. Carcassonne against St. Steve, Lesignon against Lemieux, Alby against Villeneuve, Palau Broncos against Avignon, St. Gordon's against Toulouse Broncos. Is that your team? Yes, I think it might. It must be it's yes, got to St. Gordon's. St. Gordon's. Um, obviously, we're doing a lot more coverage of the French the French Domestic League on the site this season, so for, we're looking for forward. For our partners as well, Trez Mondial. <laughs> yeah, when that... and, and, and the good thing about Twitter, you... Like you don't have no French, you can translate it to each other. Well, I mean, don't get, don't forget we have the French roundup in English every week. Oh, and every one, and once the se- once the season starts, we'll round up all the games, all the fiction results from the fresh French domestic comp. It can only be good for rugby league if uh, another domestic comp grows in in stature. They've got two divisions over there. They've got the Elite Two, which starts actually um, a bit earlier than the Elite One. They start at the end of September. Um, I don't know why. I don't know for why, but they do. Um, that's it from us on the Rugby League Lunch Hour. Please do um, like, share, comment. We'll get back to your comments if you're watching this on demand. Remember, it's on demand on sponsors, Facebook. We need sponsors. sponsors yeah. uh, available on demand on YouTube. We'll put it on the site as well. Thanks to Betfred as always, and we'll see you next week.